Long Day's Journey into Night Eugene O'Neill This video is about the relationship between Eugene O'Neill's own life and the play, Long Day's Journey into Night. About the play Seldom has the appearance of a new play aroused more interest than did the publication and New York production in 1956 of Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night. And this interest has been renewed by the recent release of the play for staging by college and community theaters throughout the country. The play compels attention both as autobiography and drama. It also challenges the hitherto generally negative answer to the question whether a play may be both pure biography and effective drama. As Autobiography Long Day's Journey into Night is perhaps the most thoroughly and authentically factual autobiography ever cast in dramatic form. The persons of the play, with the possible exception of Kathleen, the maid, are precisely as O'Neill remembered them, his father and mother, his older brother, and himself. Only some of the names are changed. The surname O'Neill becomes Tyrone, but two given names remain the same, James and the older son Jamie, James O'Neill too, there having been an illegitimate son known as James O'Neill, Jr., who died in early childhood. Ella Quinlan O'Neill the author's mother, becomes Mary Tyrone, and in a spookily transparent gesture toward anonymity, the author switches names with a brother Edmund who had died of measles as a baby. So that the Edmund of the play is actually Eugene O'Neill, and the dead Eugene of the play is actually Edmund, named after Edmund Dante, the leading role of the Count of Monte Cristo, in which, the father James O'Neill had toured for many years and made a fortune. Autobiographically the play is unique in depicting a single day as a faded focal point of relentlessly converging causes beginning with the childhood days of Eugene O'Neill's parents. Moreover, Jamie was M. Fact M. A. Sanatorium for Alcoholics at the time it was confirmed that Eugene had consumption. The interwoven reminiscences of earlier events which, in their impact on the present, supply the inner action of the play are in no way altered except for minor simplifications. And some distortions reflecting the author's bias against his father and toward his mother. It is strictly factual that James O'Neill went to work at 10 years of age to help support the remnants of the Irish immigrant family left destitute when his father, Thomas O'Neill, deserted his wife and children and returned to Ireland. While working as a machinist, James in his late teens began playing small parts with a theater company in Buffalo, soon distinguished himself as a naturally gifted young actor educated himself, and within a few years became one of the most prominent performers of Shakespearean and romantic leads in America. It is a disarmingly frank and deeply personal revelation of the intimate facts that shaped the first 24 years of America's greatest playwright and brought him to that darkest night just prior to his decision to make a career of writing. No theme or issue of conflict or action of the play is fictitious, all are documented in O'Neill biographies and the author's own recollections. The only major modifications of events consist in certain omissions and compressions, notably the collapsing of time actually involved between the appearance of Eugene's, Edmund's, illness and his consignment to a place of treatment. He did not in fact enter a sanatorium until December following the summer of the play. It is also strictly factual that James and Ella, daughter of a wealthy merchant in Cleveland, where the young actor was for a time leading man in a resident theatre company, fell passionately and romantically in love, and that they remained entirely devoted to one another, despite her extended illnesses and the bruising effects of years of touring and living in cheap hotels, until Jamie's death in 1920. Although not specified in the play, Ella O'Neill's periods of suffering included an extended illness from cancer of the breast, surgery for which was one of the earliest to be successfully attempted. Entirely accurate is the play's account of the remorse Ella O'Neill suffered over having betrayed her calling to become a nun and her share of the guilt in the death of her second son, as well as her being brought to her incurable affliction through the carelessness and ignorance of attending physicians. The author touches briefly on most of the crucial events of his own early life, his lonely boyhood on the road with his parents and at various private schools, his unstudious year at Princeton, 1906 and 1907, his occasional carousing with Jamie, his gold prospecting junket to Honduras, where he contracted malaria, his working as a seaman on voyages to South America and South Africa, his being at several times on these journeys down and out, ill and despondent to the point of suicide which he actually attempted at Jimmy, the priest's bar and lodging house in New York, and finally the breakdown of his health and his coming home to New London, Connecticut, to work on a newspaper, where we find him at the opening of the play. He omits mention, however, of his brief and ill-fated marriage, shortly after his year at Princeton, to the beautiful and patrician Kathleen Jenkins, who bore his first son, Eugene O'Neill, Jr. Long Day's journey into night is not, however, a representation of mere circumstances and events. Like all good naturalism, it is a dramatic illustration of the inexorable causal connection between past and present. 
but it is also, in some ways not intended by the author, a fascinating case study in psychoanalysis. As such, the play is far less simple than it first appears. O'Neill suggests in his dedication of the play that it is an exorcism of old sorrows, written with deep pity and understanding and forgiveness for the four misbegotten O'Neills. He also indicates that not until a quarter century after the events of the summer of 1912 did he have the courage to face my dead at last and write this play. The writing of it was certainly an act both of forgiveness of his parents and brother, and of penance for his own guilt. But evidence internal and external to the play suggests that old anger, contempt, and bitterness still remained. In fact, the ego-centered playwright seems generally to have exaggerated the faults of others and minimized his own. The representation in the play of his father's miserliness appears to be a case in point. This bitterness may explain the misrepresentation in the play of the O'Neill House in New London, which Eugene's mother stubbornly refused to regard as a home. The shabby house of gloom so much complained of by Mary Tyrone had in fact, according to biographer Doris Alexander, the tempering of Eugene O'Neill, considerable elegance, and had been built by James O'Neill with loving care at a cost of $40,000, a fortune at the time. Nevertheless, there is throughout the play evidence of the author's effort to understand and forgive, and to surmount the old scorn and anger of his early years showing through most of the scenes in a brutal exposure of James O'Neill's captious provincialism and penury, but there is infused a sense of the author's remorse over his resentment of his father. We are also made aware of the disturbing ambivalence, admitted by O'Neill, of his feeling toward the outwardly sneering but inwardly affectionate and pitiably lost Jamie, whose alcoholism, failures and cynicism had deeply infected the young Eugene. As drama Written in 1940 and 1941, toward the end of O'Neill's active writing career, Long Day's Journey into Night marks a return following experimentation in new modes, to the stark realism in which from the beginning, he had felt most at home. Like Strindberg, O'Neill's chief model, he scorned the drama of intrigue, artificially induced events, and romantically happy endings which, with few exceptions prior to the impact of O'Neill's work in the 1920s, was the only native dramatic fare known to the American theatre. Deficient both in humour and, despite his longing to be a poet, the poetic diction needed as the language of passion of the tragic content of his plays, O'Neill nevertheless conveyed a sense of power and truth. He had a burning passion to portray life as he saw it, without compromise. Above all things, he hated hypocrisy and despised affectation. He could scarcely bear to leave anything hidden even his own private grief and torment, as long day's journey into night bears ample witness. Knowing only a life of almost unrelieved personal stress, he departed only rarely from his resolve, despite popular objection to the gloom of his plays, never to portray a happiness he had never found in life. His notable departure was a wilderness. Staged at the carousel in the spring of 1958, which he wrote as a nostalgic comedy of the boyhood he would like to have had. Although not distinguished as an original philosopher or subtle psychologist, O'Neill had nevertheless learned well the lessons taught by the continental naturalists and Freud that human motives are never single or simple, and seldom entirely transparent, and that the patent rules of conventional morality do not adequately measure the hidden wells of good and evil in human character. Like Ibsen and Shaw, he had a Puritan conscience while scorning Puritan dogma. Although his writing was usually intimately personal, his characters are not merely idiosyncratic. He wrote of and for all men. It is permissible to regard even Long Day's journey into night as a representation not only of the private anguish of his own family, but of the tormented, submerged reality of the lives of people everywhere about us. Long Day's journey into night is, with the exception of Strange Interlude, O'Neill's most introspective play. In this respect, as in its appeal to pity and understanding, it bears a striking resemblance to the dramas of Chekhov, to whom O'Neill never admitted an affinity. But O'Neill could not accept the, people as will less pawns, concept of naturalism. Long Day's Journey into Night contains, as do his other works in his best vein e.g., Morning Becomes Electra, Desire Under the Elms, Beyond the Horizon, and Emperor Jones, a classically tragic pattern that balances irrevocable fate with man's free will and moral accountability. However darkly foreboding and guilt-tortured the long day of the O'Neill family's journey into night, the play is not without a hopeful gleam of the light that was to shine for three decades in the creative achievement of Eugene O'Neill. It is somewhat cheering to regard the play as a prologue, the essential crucible of anguish to the author's fulfillment as a creative writer. It may also be legitimate to keep in mind that the consumptive Eugene, Edmund, responded at once to rest and treatment at the excellent Gaylord Sanatorium to which he was sent, within a few weeks had gained considerable weight, looked and felt well, even enjoyed the freedom, friendship, and time to think that he found there, and was released as cured at the end of the minimum term of six months, most important of all, it was, in this enforced period of reflection, said O'Neill, that the urge to write first came to me.
Within a few months he had begun his first play The Web. During the next year, 1914 and 1915, he attended Professor Baker's famed Harvard 47 workshop in playwriting. In 1916 he helped organize and became the leading figure of the Provincetown Players, and only four years later, in 1920, his first long play, Beyond the Horizon, was professionally produced. It received the Pulitzer Prize, the first of a long series of awards to be won by O'Neill, culminating in the Nobel Prize in 1936. Written by Paul L. Soper. Thank you. Thank you.